reality. You take a look, Chris Rock sitting right next to Kobe Bryant, shooting the breeze, funniest man in the world, telling jokes, and take a look at Kobe Bryant. I don't even hear you. I'm on a mission. When we talk about the NBA, there's two types of fans. There's the casuals, the people who think Pascal Siakam is a game for the Toronto Raptors tonight, or the fan who has never heard of Larry Markkinen. A casual. The only way to describe it. Guess the NBA team. Bear. This is the Warriors? Sacramento? But then there's the real fans. The fans who know the ins and outs of the team, the Pistons fan who still tunes into 82 games a season, the Suns fan who could tell you that David Roddy went to Colorado State, those fans. This is right on my alley. Anybody to ever average five plus assists per game in a season and have a 25 point game. Let's go with Phil Ford to start. Boom, unicorn, light, great rookie season, UNC legend. These are the people who know what they're talking about most of the time. So I had an idea. Me personally, even though I know an incredible amount of ball, self-proclaimed, I can't sit there and watch every team play every single game. I'm not going to tell you who my team is because then you guys will call me biased. You can try and guess if you want. But anyway, since I can't watch every single team every night, I'd be lying if I told you I know the 12th man rotation problem that the Clippers have on their roster. Brandon Boston Jr. that wasn't a shot at you. Random team, random number, happen to be you. But anyway, the idea I had, if there's a social media app that has the biggest NBA fans, it's undoubtedly Twitter. What other app are you going to find a Darvid Ham Muse account on? The most hated man on the West Coast. But what I did is I reached out to one fan per team. I tried reaching accounts that have a large portion of the fan base following them. If you're a real fan of a team, you can recognize both the positives and the negatives of your team. Every team has their highs and every team has their lows. So I asked them two questions each. First, what's one thing about your team that the fan base would agree on that other fans of other teams wouldn't know? And second, what's one negative thing about your team that you could admit is true? I wanted the true insight about each team nearing the end of the season and who better to get that information from than the people who dedicate their time to run accounts about these teams. Someone who watches every game. I'll also give a little bit about what I think about these takes. I'm going to use these two logos for the questions too, by the way. But I mean, for 29 of these teams, I'm an outsider. And you probably are too. Unless you're a fan of two teams, which will be a little weird. But we'll go backwards in the standings, starting in the east. And that means we'll start with the Wizards. Damn, Pistons moving up. Didn't even realize. But for the Wizards, I talked to Greg Finberg. He's the host of the Wizards podcast. When I asked him to take the fan base would agree on, he said the team needed a rebuild for years, and it's great that they're finally doing it. I mean, I couldn't agree more. They were running Bradley Beal, Danny Advia lineups into the ground like they were about to hang banners next season. But then I asked him to tell me a negative for the Wizards. Ready for this? One negative that the fans could admit is true is we've been the laughing stock of the league for a while now, and it's totally fair. Honestly, shout out to Greg for that answer. I mean, half the time, Wizards home games turn into away games for them. That is an amazing. Wait, do you, do you hear this? Well, let's go. He chose cascading down here at the Capital One Arena. A six. Now we're looking at the Pistons. The Pistons suck. So I was curious what a real diehard fan would have to say about them. So I talked the Pistons talk. The host of a Pistons Talk podcast. A lot of the fans gave me something positive when I asked for something other fans wouldn't know, not for the Pistons. He told me that something people wouldn't know is the fact that the GM of the Pistons and the CEO hired their sons to big positions in the front office. Honestly, that doesn't sound good. The number one rule of business is always don't hire family. If you're trying to run an NBA organization, that probably won't work. 28. Sorry Pistons fans, you guys know what that number means. But well, for something negative about the Pistons fans could admit, he said this. The owner isn't involved at all, and he only shows up three times a year. The three times he shows up, the summer to announce draft picks, midseason before trade deadline, and the end of the year to talk to the media. I mean, this isn't the owner, but the Pistons GM literally said the Pistons had better offers last year for Bogdanovich. The Pistons are a mess, and that's why I wanted to hear from a real Detroit fan. I wanted to hear why they're a mess. On a side note though, it's cool to hear opinions of people who really know what they're talking about in certain scenarios. If I were to go to games and interview fans about takes they have on their specific teams in real life and ask some hard-hitting questions about their teams, would you guys watch that? I left a pinned comment. Either like the comment or reply to it and let me know. But anyway, now we're looking at the 13 seed. I was talking to Cook Him Mello. He's a Charlotte sports guy and the Hornets even follow him. He gave me two really in-depth answers. For something Hornets fans can agree on, he said, I would personally say that our young core is extremely underrated. With our team hopefully being 100% healthy to start the 24-25 season, 
a young core of LaMelo Ball, Brandon Miller, Miles Bridges, and Mark Williams could thrive in this league as a top tier young core. I mean, yeah, the Hornets have a nice young core right now, especially with Brandon Miller, someone I'm extremely high on. You guys know if you're subscribed to me, I say it like every video, even though Brandon Miller did get booed on draft night. Uh, well, to the ones that's booing, um, I'm here to let you know I'm, we're going to get a lot of wins this year. Definitely going to try to get the, you know, hold up the big trophy at the end. Um, you know, just going to have a lot of winners around me. But as good as the Hornets' young core is, a lot of Hornets fans don't feel like things will change unless the organization resets. One negative thing I can admit on is we need to reset our culture. The team the past few years has had a very bad culture, and all around they can do all better off the court and on the court. But when the team can finally fix all those issues and finally become a team with really good upside, people will finally start to see the potential Charlotte has. And then he also wrote, in addition to the second question, is that the team 100% needs a new medical staff. The last few years, our team has dealt with injury after injury and it needs to stop. Even the players said the medical staff wasn't doing things correctly. They have rushed players' injuries way too much, and me personally, I think it needs a complete change. I mean, how can you be a professional sports organization and not have a good medical staff? What is Michael Jordan the doctor? Gonna try and convince LaMelo to play on one ankle after he ate expired pizza? It's the flu game. You are convinced it was food poisoning. Can you tell us what you saw? 100% it was food poisoning. 100, 100%. You know, but obviously it just sounds better to be the flu game than the food poisoning game. That just doesn't even, that doesn't even, you know, it doesn't even roll off your tongue correctly. But that would bring us out of the country. Now we're in Toronto, the land of maple syrup and Drake. The Raptors are having a weird season. They just lost their best player because of a hand injury. So fans are stressing. So who better to reach out to than Barnes Muse? The guy who literally runs a Scotty Barnes page. Well, he had two things he thinks Raptor fans agree with. First, RJ Barrett will be an all-star next season. I like that. He's been good in Toronto, averaging almost 20 points per game, but he also said that Scotty Barnes is going to average a triple-double in his prime and win MVP one day. Averaging a triple-double is crazy. Sorry, Barnes Muse, that's the craziest take I got. But hey, maybe I'll stand corrected one day. But he did have a pretty solid negative. The Jakob Pirtle trade. It's done irreparable damage and could be one of the worst trades in NBA history because we can either take our top six pick now in a weaker draft, but if we do, we lose out on the 2025 pick in a very strong draft. I mean, yeah, it's not a great trade. It's definitely too early to say one of the worst trades in NBA history because you don't know how the draft ended up yet. I mean, the next trade it picks that ended up being Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. If that happens, that's GG's for you Raptors fans. But hey, if Scotty Barnes averages a triple-double, doesn't matter who else you have on the roster. I went to the mall before the event. I bought it. It was like $400. Guess what, though, bro? I went back to the mall today. That same shirt is back in the store, bro. I returned it, guys. City boys. Come on, man. They thought they was going to get me with the $400 shirt, bro. No, fam. It's back at the store, bro. A team the Raptors made a trade with at the trade deadline, the Brooklyn Nets. Their fans might be the most confused in the NBA if I'd say so, but they do think they have their guy. I was talking to Brooklyn Nets cast, a Nets podcast, and they told me, The general consensus among fans is that Cam Thomas is a significantly underrated passer. He isn't Mike Porter Jr.-esque like everyone else thinks. That's actually interesting. You tend to think of Cam Thomas as a guy who goes out there and gets buckets, but honestly, just looking at his assist numbers the past few games, 5, 4, 4, 4, 8, that's actually really solid for someone who thinks they're going to make every shot. Do you ever criticize your own shot selection? Honestly, yeah. You but do? Yeah, but I feel like I can make it, so I don't, I'll be like, oh, man. So, you know, when I shoot, I'll be like, ah, maybe that was a bad shot. This is why I asked the question. You know, because you know, sometimes I'm like, ah, oh, maybe that was a bad shot, but I was like, I work on that, could have went in. Yeah, and I'm like, exactly. all right, watch it. <laughs> if, <laughs> the reason I asked the question is because I feel like... <laughs> People that score tough buckets, they really believe that every shot they take is going to go in. I swear I do. <laughs> yeah. So there's no such thing as a bad shot in some ways. And then, but even if Nets fans like some of their players, they're pretty conscious about the direction of the franchise as a whole. Nets are in a bottom three situation in the NBA, not having own picks till 2027 and no superstar on the roster. Respect for admitting that Nets cast. The Nets are in a tough situation, definitely one of the worst in the league, but another team who's in a weird situation. Maybe not as bad as the Nets, but definitely not great, the Atlanta Hawks. When telling you finding a Hawks fan to participate was one of the hardest teams to find, I mean it. Do the Hawks not have a fan base? I'm confused. But I ended up finding one, Zebster114. 
He's a big part of Hawks Twitter, but he's one of the guys that gave me two negative things about their team. For starters, something the fan base can agree on as a whole, he said we can agree DeJounte Murray is pretty overrated. Damn, that's tough. I mean, we're talking about a guy that did this in back-to-back -back games, and the Hawks fans think he's overrated. Quinn says play on. Murray, three seconds, two. DJ for the win. Got it! Yes. Second six. Here we go again. Can Murray do it again? A three for the win. Yes! Good! DeJounte Murray! He does it again! When I asked him something negative about the Hawks season, he was pretty straight up. We're pretty mediocre slash below average. I mean, yeah, they're a borderline playing team. There's really no arguing that. It seems like Hawk fans are struggling with the way he answered these. Shout out to him though. But now we gotta move to Chicago. For this, I went to Bulls Kick Ass. A Bulls account with over 40,000 Bulls fans following. I think the elephant in the roof for Chicago is that the Bulls are just so mid. They've been a 500 team forever, and I didn't even have to bring that up. That's the first thing he mentioned. I would say that most Bulls fans are more harder on the Bulls than any other fan base ever could be. Bulls fans are desperate for a team that'll contend. I think other fans probably think that the Bulls fans are just okay with this 500 stuff. We aren't. Honestly, you gotta feel for Bulls fans a little. Well, the ones who weren't around for Michael Jordan. If you ever witnessed Michael Jordan on your favorite team, I don't feel bad for you. If you were born in 99 or after and a Bulls fan, I do feel bad for you. But yeah, that's basically what he said, and then I asked him a negative about the team too. I think most fans would say the biggest negative is the owner really just doesn't care about the team. The vice president and GM don't ever make trades and the coach is checked out. I get it man, but don't be so hard on the GM. He's working hard. He got Julian Phillips last year. Give him a break. Aren't we like uh, at the same amount practically? I'm yeah, rolling it though. You're like five points ahead of me. But I'm rolling it. Uh, oh, wait, that that was the <laughs> oh, so that was the most pointless thing in the world. <laughs> But I'm still rolling in it. It's time to go to Indy. I said that the Hawks fans were hard to find. Pacer fans were even harder. Easily top 5 hardest. There were two harder ones, but we'll get to that later. But after years of research, I found the 2K Messiah, a big Pacer fan. And honestly, he really knew what he was talking about. He had a great answer for things fans would agree on. Aaron Neesmith is one of the best young wings in the league, and is on the best non-rookie contract in the league. Super underrated. I like that one a lot. Honestly, because I thought Neesmith was going to be a star when he was drafted. Box score watching, he's been terrible lately. But well, maybe he's in a slump. 12.3 points per game on 51-45 splits is really good. So I'll give him a W for that. But for negative, he did say this. We have one of the worst defenses in the league, and the team lives and dies with Tyrese Halliburton. Halliburton's great, don't get me wrong. But if you live and die by him, well, I'll let you look. Guess which one of these games the Pacers won? Yep, Helligan's game where he had zero. Joking, the Mavs game. The Basers really do live and die by Tyrese Halliburton. That's crazy. I'm shooting it. I'm shooting it if I'm Jordan. <laughs> so I feel you, Jordan. I would have shot that too. That's why you're here with us. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stop in Florida for a little bit. Miami first. The Heat. What a weird year this team is having. About 5,000 Heat pages duck me. They think they're Drake or something. But I did get a response from Heat vs. Refs. A Heat discussion page with over 5,000 Heat fans following? Although the name Heat vs. Refs does sound like he's gonna be biased. But let's take a look at what he had to say. Regardless of seating, attention for the media, all-star selections, all these individual awards, forget about all that. At the end of the season when it's playoff time, we'll be in the finals. I mean, they made it as the 8 seed last year, it's pretty hard to deny it. They made it in the bubble too. The Heat just always find a way in the playoffs. And you already know Patty Mills is gonna turn into the second coming of Reggie Miller in the conference finals. But then he did admit, the main negative about the Heat is the fan base. Every year they want their own Tyler Hero gone, or our young players like Jovic gone. They always want these watch stars to come every year, and they're wishy-washy, not all but a lot. Heat fans, I guess I could see it. I remember Heat fans dying to trade for James Harden and Damian Lillard. Not that they are great anymore, but they aren't who they used to be, even though Dame still clearly wants to be in Miami. You could create your own starting five. What's your team? It would be me, LeBron, Steph, Kevin Durant, and I'm gonna go with Bam out of bio. Staying in Florida, we're headed up north a little to Orlando. The Magic are that next team up in my opinion. So I wanted to either confirm or deny that with a real Magic fan. So I talked to Well God, over 11,000 Orlando Magic followers. His bio says follow him for Orlando Magic humor, and he delivered on that. 
Netflix was able to release five seasons of Cobra Kai in less time it took for Jonathan Isaac to return back from injury. That's why not many people outside of Orlando know that Jonathan Isaac is the best defender in the NBA when healthy. I mean, I feel like a lot of us know Jonathan Isaac is great when he's healthy, he just isn't healthy, that's the issue. But his issue for the Orlando Magic? Well, this is what he said. It's annoying how the Magic jack up the prices for the Knicks game, because only the New Yorkers who live in Orlando will pay premium to see Julius Randle. The Kia Center ends up being a home game for the Knicks, because once again, no Magic fan is paying the premium for Julius Randle. I get being a Magic fan and being annoyed with that, but I'm not here for the Julius Randle slander. Won't be tolerated. <laughs> More chance of let's go Knicks here in Orlando. Randall hits the first. Now we're at Philly. Philly was going to have the back-to-back -back MVP until he got hurt. Joel Embiid. That's why I talked to Embitch. He wanted me to make sure you guys knew he's a Sixer fan, but just thought it was a funny play on, on Embiid's name. He is not an Embiid hater, I'd hope. But he wrote a lot. I won't show the full thing because I'm not going to sit here and read paragraphs to you guys but I'll just tell you what he said instead. For something the fan base agrees on would be that all Sixer fans agreed on the coaching changes. They believe Doc didn't develop the young guys properly and loved the firing, and they all like the Nick Nurse hiring and believe he's leading the team down the right way. I feel like this is the case for most teams. The fan base usually agrees on the coaching situation for a team, but something negative he did admit, they have a joke of a GM in front office. He said that Embiid isn't perfect and deserves critique, but it's unfair to judge him the same way as Tatum and Giannis. Year after year, the supporting cast looks like contenders and then collapse at the end of the year. And the conversation still relies around whether Embiid could get it done, not around the front office. He's basically saying in a nutshell, the front office sucks as a whole. What do you guys think about this? Does the Sixer front office suck? I mean, I don't know. Remember what James Harden said about Daryl Morey? Uh, Daryl Morey is a liar. And I will never be a part of an organization that he's a part of. Let me say that again. Daryl Morey is a liar, and I will never be a part of an organization that he's a part of. Me. Now we're in New York, the New York Knicks. The Knicks are another really interesting team this year, and they just dealt with injuries. For the Knicks, I talked to. But for something the fan base could agree on, he became the anti Orlando Magic fan, how important Julius Randle is, and that he's deserved his All Star and All NBA appearances. He's generally had a pretty bad rep on here in other places. I mean, yeah, since Randall's been out, you can clearly see how much worse the Knicks have been. He's a three-time All-Star, they need him. And remember how Knicks fans were treating him last year? Tear it down, break it down. Whoa! Whoa, are they ripping? Oh, no! It's a bad look. But when I asked him about a negative he could admit, he said this. It's going to be very hard to get that additional star without having any more young pieces to give up, just banging on picks at this point. Makes sense. No more Barrett, Quickly, Grimes, or Toppin. They're going to have to bank on a team just wanting a complete rebuild. Or they're going to have to include a Julius Randle. Everything he said here makes sense. But the team the Knicks played in last year's playoff, the Cavs, they've been on fire. So I talked to Cavs moves. He told me one thing the fans would agree on is that Sam Morrell deserves meaningful playoff minutes. I mean, look at his last few games. The guy clearly has an elite ability to get hot from downtown, so that never hurts when he's out on the court. Those are straight 2K numbers. One two-pointer attempted in the three games. Remember that college player from a few years ago who took 133 shots and all of them were threes? Same vibes. But for the Cavs negative, he said that JB Bickerstaff lineup rotations are very questionable. He said there's times a player will get hot and they just won't see the floor again. I mean, Cavs don't really lose, so it's hard to pick a negative probably. But then we go to Milwaukee. For this, I reach out to own him Marjan. Do you know how big of a Bucks fan you have to be to run a Marjan Bo Camp page? I'd like to think this guy knows what he's talking about. And the thing he said Bucks fans know, AJ Green could be a top 5 shooter in the league if given opportunity. Let's see. 42.3% on 222 attempts from 3, and then 14 for 15 from the line. Yeah, checks out. Great shooter, no opportunity. But then for the negative, he said the lack of consistency for Dame could hurt us in the playoffs. Yeah, Dame's been having a rough year. 
but the team always picks it up in the playoffs. So I guess we'll see what happens when it comes down to it. But for the best team in the East and currently the best team in the NBA, the Boston Celtics. For this, I talked to Celtics Unite, a Celtics page with 7,000 followers, and he also claims to be a Jalen Brown enthusiast. There's a lot good to be said about the Celtics this year, but one thing he picked out specifically, how good Drew Holiday is, and he's genuinely sacrificed so much for us to win. He's not talked about at all, but he's the glue guy. I 100% agree, Drew Holiday is the difference. He's an NBA champion, plays elite defense, just knows how to win basketball games. Listen to other players talk about him. Drew Holiday is solidified as probably the best defender in the league at the at the guard position. You know, you put Drew in any system, any coach is going to ask him to guard the best player. I mean, we we played them in 2018, second round, and he guarded me the whole series. And he was picking me up full court. He was guarding me in the post. And I actually, it it was tough to it was tough to dribble on Drew Holiday. He slides his feet so so well. He got good hands. He's strong. He got good instincts. Like I gained a lot of respect for him in that series because he went from guarding me to Clay to Steph to guarding Draymond, neutralizing pick and rolls. Like he he's special. As great as Boston's been this year, here's the negative he mentioned with the team. While it hasn't happened a lot this year, this team comes out and sometimes just doesn't show up. Of course, we all saw it in the playoffs last year, but it's happened this year too. I can see it. I mean, going to OT with the Pistons is crazy, I can't lie. Especially when you're the best team in the NBA. But the Celtics are great, and there really isn't much bad to say about them. But there is a team with a lot bad to say right now, and then brings us out west. Up first, the San Antonio Spurs. I mean, they have this one guy who happens to be really good at basketball. You'll hear about him in a second. But I talked to the final quant about the Spurs. His bio says Spurs space is legend, so yeah, he knows what he's talking about. But yeah, I mentioned the positive. Victor Wembenyama, and that's what he mentioned too. Wemby's better than advertised, and even though he's in a lot of highlights and online clips, unless you see him playing a game, it doesn't justify his skill set. He reads the game faster than he should, he commands so much attention on offense and defense, and his intelligence is off the charts. He's known as an alien across the league because of his body type, but the dude is a true basketball savant. I agree with him honestly. I value defense, and the way he changes the whole entire team from the defensive end is crazy to watch. It really is something we've never seen before. But of course, as great as the one guy is, there has to be negatives. I'm concerned the Spurs front office is going to move too slow with Wemby and expect him to do things their way. It already looks like they want him to conform to them, rather than the other way around. My hope is they pair him with more top tier talent, sooner rather than later, but we could see a much slower and methodical roster build than fans would even like. We just hope this doesn't come at the expense of Wemby's frustration. Man, this guy already seems worried that Wemby might ask out. Nah, but for real, I can really see Trey Young ending up there. It seems like the perfect combo. Get that done, Spurs. I'm waiting on it. But then we gotta move over to Portland. For this one, I reached out to 503 Blazer fans. They were on a Portland Trailblazers podcast. He gave me two answers that actually really surprised me. For something fans can agree on, he said Shaden Sharp is gonna be a superstar and has potential to be a top 15 player within the next three to five years. The reason this surprised me so much was because the negative comment he said. Anthony Simons may not have what it takes to be a legitimate first option on a playoff team. That's really interesting because I always thought it was the other way around. Simons has always stood out to me as the next guy for the Blazers, but I have to admit, if there's a team who knows about elite point guards, it's the Trailblazers. Well, the Warriors too, but the Blazers will be second. Yeah, he's pretty good. Um, I don't know if he's. I don't know. I don't know why they call him Ant. Like, it's, what's his, how is his name spelled? A N F. So I don't get the the um, correlation. No, for sure. Um, yeah, I think uh, they should call him a different name. <laughs> but it's yeah. I mean, my name is A N T. You get where I'm coming from. And his name is A N F. But as far as basketball player, he's he's really good to me. Uh, he make tough shots. Um, he defends like he he can play. And so if they want to call him Ant, they call him Ant Number Two. But yeah, it's cool. <laughs> now we're out to Memphis, the home of the two greatest music artists of all time, Aretha Franklin and Blockboy JB. The Grizzlies are extremely banged up this year, and who better to hear from than someone who watches every game? Grizz 901 Live, a Grizzlies post-game show. What they said for the first question really actually surprised me. Marcus Smart will need to become the Grizzlies' sixth man or sent out in a trade for a player that better fits next to John Morant if they want to be a true title contender. This one's confusing to me. Maybe it's because Bain's also a small guard, but Smart's a guy every team would love to have. I mean, the guy just won Defensive Player of the Year two years ago. 
But for the negatives, here's what he said. Luke Kennard has the highest shooting percentage in the NBA, but those numbers are a little fake. He can't create his own shots and shoots only when he's left wide open. So Kennard's out there taking practice jumpers, huh? I mean, 46% from deep is crazy, and he's bound to get more open looks when everyone's healthy and they're collapsing on guys like John Bain, right? I guess we'll see. But now we got the Houston Rockets. The Rockets are an interesting team. They started up the season extremely hot but cooled down since. Honestly, I thought this was the season they were going to step up. So I reached out to Rockets Muse, a Rockets page with over 7,000 followers. And this, this is the guy that gave me two negative things. When I asked him something the fanbase can agree on, he basically told me the fanbase is so toxic. There's two parts of the Rockets fanbase. One that's Rockets fans and one that's player only fans. It's been this way dating all the way back to Yao Ming and Tracy McGrady, Jeremy Lin and James Harden, currently it's Singoon and Jalen Green. These types of fans are the worst and most toxic because they breed decisiveness in the fan base. This is probably the fan he's talking about. Fuck Harden. Sorry ass bitch. <laughs> Rockets fan, it seems like you guys are struggling. Because for the negative, he said this. We're not sure if we have a true number one option yet. It could be Sengun. He's tracking favorably in that direction and stats seem to indicate that he's on track to be on that hub that you could build a team around. But we just don't know for sure yet. He's only 21. He needs more shooters around him so we could see what he's truly capable of being. Well, a few hours after this, Sengun went for 45 and 16. Rocket fans, there's your guy. But now we're in Utah. When I tell you how hard it was to find a Utah Jazz fan, holy shit, man. Not even trying to find a Jazz fan to participate, that wasn't the problem. It was just finding a Jazz fan in general. But eventually, I found one, Jazzman Tyler. And honestly, for something I wouldn't know, I really didn't know this. But he told me how much Jazz fans still love Rudy Gobert. We love Rudy Gobert, he comes second. It goes to Jazz as a team, any team with Gobert, teams with former Jazzmen on them, and then everyone else. Man, why are they so nice in Utah? Too nice almost. Yeah, they're way too nice. But then I asked my negative about the Jazz. This is what he said. They'll likely never land an all-star caliber free agent or even a borderline all-star. They'll have to build through players through the draft and very careful trades with the assumption that the star will leave a free agency. We know nobody dreams of making it to the NBA than living in Salt Lake City, Utah. Well, i never been to Salt Lake City, Utah, and I never dreamed of it. Although I'd be there in a second if somebody books me a flight. I'm not against it at all. But at least he's self-aware that they probably won't get a big time free agent. That definitely is a big negative about a franchise. But then there's another team who can get a big free agent, and that's the Golden State Warriors. They are good this year though. So I talked to Warriors Muse, a Warriors account with over 90,000 followers. If you're not a Warriors fan, I know you're not going to like what he said for something the fan base can agree on. As Dubs fans, we feel like the Warriors might be up there as the most disadvantaged teams in terms of fouls. Also, Steph never has a superstar whistle. I mean, maybe it's true, but I feel like every fan base don't feel like they get enough calls. It's the nature of the game. So I'm not going to say it's a good thing or bad thing that he said that. It just is what it is. But he did admit as a negative, no lead is ever safe. And he mentioned the Nuggets game in January in specific. Remember, they were up 14 with 5 minutes left. Then the Nuggets came back and Jokic hit this shot. Jokic has it. Clock ticks. Got to put one up. Jokic for the win. It's funnier that the Warriors and Lakers are back-to-back -back in the standings. They're just the two drama-filled teams. But for the Lakers, when I tell you I had to reach out to at least 15 Laker fans to one answered, it was by far the most out of any team. I guess they're all too Hollywood for me. But eventually, I did get a response from Dan the Lakers fan, so shout out to him. He's the creator of Court Kings and Around the League and also runs a Lakers podcast. Well, of course, the Lakers are one of the most storied franchises in NBA history, They've had Wilt, Kareem, Magic, Kobe, Shaq, LeBron. But for something the fan base can agree on, he said this. One thing about our team is that every real Laker fan agrees there's no player, including LeBron, bigger than the Lakers franchise, period. We always root for the name in the front of the jersey, first and foremost. I like that. They don't care who it is. They just want the Lakers to win. But they do have one problem with the organization. Darvin Ham. 99.9% .9 of the fan base wants him gone due to his lack of play calling poor rotations, and lack of in-game adjustments. We're convinced that the 0.1% that still wants him to coach the Lakers are his relatives. So apparently every Laker fan hates Darvin Ham. I don't know. Laker fans, do you? 
But then next up is the Dallas Mavericks. The Mavs have been falling as the season went on, but Mavs Muse told me what's going on in the organization and how the fan base feels. Over 35,000 Mavs fans follow him, so I'd assume he knows how the community feels. But this is what he said. As much as Luka complains, the Mavs have one of the worst whistles in the league. Kyrie shoots almost no free throws even though he's always on the floor, and Luka could probably shoot double the free throws he gets every night. Yeah, the Warriors whistle syndrome. Everyone's got it. Again, I'm not going to say he's wrong, but it's how every fan base feels. So again, it is what it is. But he did give me a negative. Jason Kidd is terrible at in-game adjustments. Going from Rick Carlisle, who was one of the best in the business at it, to Kidd is tough. They seem to be losing a lot, and clearly, Luka isn't happy. Well, there is a timeout called. The water boy does not get paid enough for that. But next up will be the Sacramento Kings. This is a team I'm surprised isn't higher in the standings. I thought they'd be much better this season, so I talked to Keegan Muse. Again, you gotta be a diehard to run a Keegan Murray account, but he gave me a throwback on what the fanbase agrees on. The refs were paid against us in the Lakers' favor in the 2002 Western Conference Finals. The ref went to jail. Kings should probably have one or two more chips. I mean, we all know that was rigged. Did the ref really go to jail though? That Mike Baby team really should have a ring. But for all the free throws the Lakers took in that game, his negative for the Kings of the season was the Kings are allergic to making free throws. So I looked it up. He was right. The Kings are last in free throw percentage. 72.9%. How are they that bad? Maybe that's why they aren't as good as they should be. I don't care how many free throws they missed though. They have one of the greatest free throw misses of all time. If you were making them sick. Oh, oh my, my goodness, God. Darren Fox throws it off the front of the rim and ties the game. Are you kidding? The current six seed in the West is the Phoenix Suns. We all know the Suns literally can't stay healthy. That's their biggest problem, of course. But Ride B told me the real problem with the Suns. Well, for starters, everyone thinks because they don't have a traditional point guard, it'll never work. He said, the Suns not having a traditional point guard isn't really much of a problem for this team like everyone says. It's mainly the lack of chemistry and availability that leads to some of the jank and sloppiness people see from them. I mean, it makes sense. They're never healthy. But they have more problems than that. He said, the Suns are so bad at consistently getting up threes, despite having multiple players that are good to great shooters. Also, we're pathetic in fourth quarters when we have big leads. Yeah, that'll be a problem. If you have a big lead, Kevin Durant and Devin Booker, you've got to figure out a way to close games. Of course, that's a problem. But then, we're heading out to New Orleans. Retro Pels is a guy who told me about the Pelicans. I mean, his bio says Herb Jones saved my life. And Herb Jones is the guy he told me about. Herb Jones is one of the most slept on players in the league. Other fan bases truly don't understand how great Herb Jones is. If he played for their team, they would think he's their favorite player. Every team has that guy. The other guy fan bases aren't aware of to a full extent. And Herb Jones makes perfect sense for the Pelicans guy. Five said it before this man is not first team all defense I, I don't know what requirements you need to make it at that point as great as herb jones has been though he said the team has yet to prove out they can close tight games that's always my question with the pelicans personally who do they go to in the end of tight games i guess we'll see in the playoffs but the four seed in the west is the clippers the clippers have been playing really good basketball recently of course their guy is Kawhi. so i talked to Kawhi ring for the info on the clippers but for as good as the Clippers been playing, he decided to give me two negatives also. For something the fans can agree on, he said the Clippers haven't had a real draft pick since Blake Griffin in 2009. I mean, he isn't wrong, look at this list. The only above average player is Miles Bridges who they traded right away, so I guess that could be a problem too. But for the actual problem with the Clippers, he said this. This team is a complete lack of size and has key players that have struggled and will struggle in physical playoff environments. Which is weird to think about because Kawhi only gets better in the playoffs but I guess you can't rely on Kawhi to do everything once it comes down to it though. But now we have the reigning champions, the Denver Nuggets. And me personally, I really do think the Nuggets go back to back. So I reached out to a big Nugget fan, Mile High Addy, to get their take on this too. And he said something I really never thought of for something the fan base can agree on. Peyton Watson. He said if you give Watson minutes, he'll be recognized as one of the league's best defenders. He said he's a lot like a Sar Thompson. The shot blocking wing will make all defensive teams in his career. Drive to the basket. Yeah, I could see it. For the negative about the Nuggets, he said this. Everything outside of the starting five is a toss-up. Don't know how many people are guaranteed playoff minutes and whether it'll fluctuate. Our bench is young and inconsistent, though manageable. That's actually a great point. Besides of the core five we know of, who gets minutes when it matters? That's another thing we're going to see when it comes to playoff time. 
but the current two seed in the West is Oklahoma City. They've been on fire. And for this, I took Thunder Muse, a big OKC Thunder account. What he said for the fan base question, I completely agree with. Jalen Williams is already an all-star caliber and should be mentioned in most improved convos. I agree with that 100%. If you're 22 shooting over 50% from the field and over 40% from deep averaging 19 points per game, you're doing something right. But then he did have a negative to say as well. While the three-point shooting has been historic during the regular season, I'm nervous for the playoffs. We've already had spacing issues during the season with Giddy and in the playoffs, I don't think teams will really trust Ludor to keep shooting 40%. That's always something that matters. Spacing in the playoffs is completely different than the regular season, because in the playoffs, the speed fluctuates. So the question is, will the Thunder keep that up playoff time? I guess we'll see. But that brings us to the one seed, the Minnesota Timberwolves. They've been elite all season. And to confirm this, I talked to Zach Rodin, a sports broadcaster and a big time Timberwolves fan. The Wolves have been elite on defense. He told me this specifically. Rudy Gobert is elite guarding the perimeter from a big man standard, and he's been scapegoated as a bad perimeter defender because he couldn't make up for mistakes of his jazz teammates in the postseason. I can see it. Gobert is a big defensive player of the year favorite, and for good reason. But for as good as the Wolves have been, they do have one flaw. He said the offense is a real issue in the postseason if Jaden McDaniels can't consistently figure it out. I mean, if one of your starters can't figure out the offense, of course that's a problem. I guess we'll see how it unfolds in the playoffs. Really, we'll see how all these things unfold in the playoffs. Like I said, there's casual fans, and then there's diehards that know the in and outs of their team. And it was really interesting to get takes from people who watch the ins and outs of every game. We'll see if they know what they're talking about come June. See you then.